so thanks for being here, and uh, thanks for being willing to perhaps broaden your horizons in uh, hearing a talk that is primarily about biology. Uh, it's kind of a strange thing to talk about biology to a group of hydrogeologists, but well, here we are. And mainly because I think it's important, and I wanted to show you some of the lessons I've learned about the importance of biology to the hydrological processes that we all know and love. So I've been working at the interface between groundwater and surface water my entire career. When I started, <clears throat> the first uh, 10 years or so, I'd say it was kind of a backwater subdiscipline of hydrogeology. Not that many people were working in the area. Um, it was easy to keep up with the literature. Starting around the late 1990s, this, uh, this paper came out in 1998. Uh, Tom Winter and three of his colleagues uh, published this. The lesson being that groundwater and surface water, you know, we had been studying those domains separately. They were linked. It really was one single resource. And this resonated with the uh, water resource managers, and things really took off. Uh, tens of thousands of these documents were distributed. Universities were using them as a, as a teaching aid. And then for quite a bit of time afterwards, <clears throat> additional papers came out. I mean, this, this one was a, this was a conceptual paper that primarily talked about the processes. Uh, but there were a lot of questions. Well, how do you make the measurements? How do you quantify the exchange? So several papers started to come out, uh, reports about how to quantify these processes. And it's only accelerated since then. And it's getting pretty tough to stay current with the literature, even with the reviews of the literature uh, in the last few years. You know, quite a few reviews continue to come out talking about these processes and the importance and the implications of beyond hydrogeology. But there's still a lot that we don't know. And any one of these, these items on this list could have been a, a keynote talk. I mean, there, there's so many questions remaining to be addressed. Uh, this is going to be a rich area of science for a long time. But the one thing that we do know, the one thing that we can be confident of, the one thing that we're comfortable talking about is that Q, uh, ex expressed here as volume per area, is related to hydraulic conductivity times hydraulic gradient. This is at the core of hydrogeology. We know this. We understand this. <clears throat> but we also understand that, you know, we don't really have a good handle on K. Hydraulic conductivity is scale dependent. It's hugely variable. If we get within a, a factor of five, we're thrilled. So there's a lot of uncertainty there. And in these kinds of setting, there's a lot of heterogeneity there. And it's difficult to quantify. Sure, we can, we can do a, a slug test and get K in this vicinity here. But we almost never know what the K is of this thin veneer of sediment that could be orders of magnitude different. So what we really need is a vertically integrated value of K. In fact, that would be a number that we could use uh, as a parameter for a model. Well, one great way to do that is to measure the seepage along with measuring the hydraulic gradient because that can then give us a vertically integrated value for K. And we know how to do this. This is something that we all know and love, installation of monitoring wells, piezometers. We install this piezometer. We can measure this distance that the screen is below the lake bed. We can measure the difference in, in head in the well and stage and the surface water. We can calculate a hydraulic gradient. We can do that maybe not as well as we think we can, if anybody saw a talk earlier this week about the challenges of making these measurements. But we can do this. We know how to do this. And if we can also measure seepage, well, we get that K. We get the number that we want at the scale that's appropriate for these processes. A lot of people don't understand or know much about uh, methods for quantifying this exchange. And we now have quite a few in our tool bag. But the only one that directly measures flow across the sediment water interface is a seepage meter. It's ridiculously simple. It's one of the cheapest scientific instruments that I've ever used. And I think because of that, a lot of people have not really been careful about minimizing error. And a lot of people that have gone out and made these measurements got, well, maybe 
some pretty poor data, and they thought, ah, this is a joke. But really, if you know the sources of error, if you take care to minimize them, if you use the latest technology, you can get good, repeatable data from this very simple device. And it's as simple as this. This is an open-ended cylinder uh, that isolates a portion of the sediment bed. And typically, if you use the cutoff end of a storage drum like David Lee did when he introduced this device in the late 70s, it covers about a quarter of a square meter. And so any flow that moves across this sediment water interface, if it's upward, ends up in a storage bag. If it's downward, it comes from the storage bag. <laughs> All we have to do is measure the change in volume in the bag and the time that the bag was attached to the meter, divide by the area covered by the meter, and we have Q. It's as simple as that. So, hey, we're living large. We can constrain the system pretty well. Everything is good. However, this only applies, this only works if it's completely dependent on hydraulic conductivity and hydraulic gradient. And the rest of my talk is going to be about how that's not always the case. Now, this is a list of some of the processes that can create or alter seepage that are not necessarily dependent on the hydraulic gradients that we typically measure with monitoring wells. And uh, you can read the list here. And in fact, if you want to look more at this process, this is a really nice review paper that came out a few years ago uh, that, that provide, these are, these are taken right from that paper. And they talk about all these various processes that, that can affect seepage that are not related to hydraulic gradient. So this is one on a, actually this is dependent on hydraulic gradient, but on a time scale that we don't normally think about and a physical scale that we, hard, we pretty much can't measure. Uh, it's on a scale of seconds with regard to waves, on a scale of hours with regard to tides. Currents, currents moving in the surface water can affect and can create seepage that we would never know about if we're measuring gradients with a piezometer. Density-driven flow is something that uh, the piezometers would have a difficult time uh, uh, figuring out, and it's a, it could be a challenging process in these uh, nearshore marine settings. Gas, gas trapped in the sediment, and there's a, commonly a lot of gas in the sediment because these areas tend, tend to have uh, a production of gas from decay of organic material production of methane and carbon dioxide that could entrain water as the bubbles accumulate and increase in volume and rise to the surface. They're pulling water with it. They're creating seepage. This is one that I thought when I, when I saw this paper, I thought, wow, they're being very thorough because, wow, this can't be much of a process. It's pretty small, pretty slow. At the scale that we study things, this probably isn't a big factor. And then I realized, <laughs> I've measured this. Uh, some years ago, we put a pressure transducer inside a seepage meter and I had somebody walk past the seepage meter within about a, a meter distance from the seepage meter. And every one of these red arrows was a pressure pulse. Every one of these pressure pulses was inducing flow to that meter just because of the compaction of sediment somewhere in the vicinity of the meter. And you might say, well, that's a small effect. And you're right, it is. But when you're measuring changes in volume, when you're measuring rates of flow on the order of one to two milliliters per hour, and those are the kinds of rates of flow we're trying to measure, a sudden pulse of flow related to somebody walking past the meter could matter. It could matter quite a bit. So even the sediment compaction could be a substantial source of error. But I'm gonna to talk today about biology and how these organisms that are just living out their life in this ecotone are creating sometimes substantial rates of flow across the sediment water interface that, as you'll see, are easily measurable in some cases. So we commonly call this bioirrigation, and, and that refers to the current, the flow, the seepage, if you will, created by these organisms living in the bed. And you would say, well, <laughs> Look at the scale here. Here's our centimeter scale. So this little thing is, you know, one or two or three centimeters long. How could that possibly create a, a seepage rate that's measurable that matters to, to anything other than just, you know, the interest in the process? And I would say, you're right. It can't matter unless it's joined with its friends. When, 
There are 500 to 2,000 of these things in every square meter. <laughs> they can create seepage that could, in, in this case, um, a lake in Germany uh, near Berlin. Uh, these, these people, uh, Baranoff et al., determined that these organisms, these coronamids, filter enough water that's equivalent to the entire volume of the lake every week. So that's substantial, that's big, that's a major rate of exchange that's not driven by any hydraulic gradients that we'd be measuring. But you know, we always have to match the scale of our measurement with the scale of the process. And if you're looking at these flow tubes that are on the order of a half a centimeter or something like that, our seepage meter is covering a much bigger area. If we happen to put the meter here, we'll get downward flow. If we, have to put the meter, if we happen to put the meter here, we get upward flow. But more realistically, given the size of our meter relative to the size of the process, it's all going to get spatially averaged, and we're never going to see this, right? So maybe it doesn't matter from the kinds of measurements that we're making. But I would say sometimes it does, based on the data that I've collected, and I'll show you some examples. What's it look like? What do these organisms look like? I didn't know I'm not a biologist, so I went to the Google, and these are some of the images that came up. Whoops. So here's a, uh, a bent nose clam. Evidently, these do a lot of this kind of work. Uh, these uh, ghost shrimp, there's a tunnel. It gives you a sense of the scale. This is a photograph that I took myself. I didn't know what it was at the time, other than interesting features on the bed, but I've been told these likely are ghost shrimp uh, tunnels that they create and they live in and they filter water. It flows through there. What does it look like? This is bioirrigation happening. This is taken right from a USGS report from a few years ago. And uh, you can see the process. I'm pretty sure that was a, a, a siphon from a clam. But what's entertaining, amazing actually to me, is that there are 10,000 of these things per square meter in Klamath Lake in Southern Oregon. So this is a substantial process that we've largely ignored as hydrogeologists, and they can create some major uh, rates of exchange. And the information continues to come forth in the literature. This is a, re a study, a report that was published just this year that uh, shows more information on these organisms. If you're interested in pursuing this, what amazed me was, was this bit right here that these ghost shrimp burrows can be as much as a half a meter deep. So this is a much greater volume of exchange than I would have ever guessed based on the size of the organisms creating this flow. So, so it's a pretty substantial process. I first became aware of this when I was working in a place called Hood Canal. It's in Puget Sound, which is in, is in the northwestern part of the state of Washington, which is in the northwestern part of the United States. And we were there because of excess nutrients. We were getting harmful algal blooms that were killing fish, that were making people sick. And our part of the process of the study was to determine the extent to which groundwater was contributing to the nutrient budget in this lake, in this uh, estuary. So we, we came out with our seepage meters and our piezometers, and we're making these measurements along this transect. And this is during the falling tide. The tidal range here was pretty big. Um, and we were getting reasonable data, except for one location. There was this one thorny site that was giving us data that I couldn't understand. The, the piezometer was indicating an upward gradient, and the seepage meter was indicating downward seepage. There are numerous sources of error associated with making these measurements, and I had tried every trick I knew, looked for the source of error that might be creating these weird data. They were consistent, consistently downward. And in the end, I just put question marks in my notebook and as we were pulling out, um, I noticed these, these interesting features in the bed, but I didn't know what they were. As we were pulling out, my colleague said, oh, wow, look at the nice colony of ghost shrimp. Well, by the time I got there, they were gone, so they were a ghost to me. Um, I didn't know what a ghost shrimp was, but I wrote it down in my notebook anyway. And then um, that, that's a ghost shrimp. Uh, that's another image from the, from the internet, from the Google. Uh, but then about a year later, this report came out, and there was ghost shrimp in this list of organisms that can create bioirrigation. 
And they were saying it could create flow on the order of two-tenths of a centimeter per day. Well, the numbers I had measured were much, much larger than that. Uh, but some of these other organisms create quite a bit larger values. Here's a value as large as five centimeters per day from a plumed worm. Maybe there were other organisms in addition to ghost shrimp, I didn't know. And just so you know, you probably don't have any sense for what these numbers mean relative to gradient-driven seepage rates. So some years ago, a couple of colleagues and I uh, decided we would scour the literature and come up with a global average for seepage rates in lakes. And, and we came up with numbers that were on the order of 0 0.6, 0 0.7 centimeters per day. So these rates are pretty substantial. They're right within this range of seepage that we typically measure um, in lakes. Now in rivers, I'd say that number's about an order of magnitude larger. And I, I don't know what that would be in marine settings, but um, we're continuing to study that. But it's substantial and it's relevant. And I'll show you some examples of, of how it's, it's uh, fooled me uh, over the years. So here's an example of freshwater bioirrigation. Most of these bioirrigation examples are from marine settings, but I've got some from freshwater that I don't think many other people have, have ever seen. So here we are in north central Minnesota. And the reason I was there was because we had a very large downward hydraulic gradients at this location. Uh, exceptionally large and, and high hydraulic conductivity, so big, big rates of flow from this lake. Uh, for interesting reasons, it's a, it's a separate study. If you want to know more, I could tell you. But here's a piezometer that we can drive to various depths up to three meters beneath the bed and measure the hydraulic gradients. So we're getting nice, big downward gradients. So I deployed four seepage meters all in a row. You can only see a couple here. And they were indicating downward flow. Downward flow, downward flow, huh? Upward flow, plus, plus indicates upward flow. Well, how could that be? I think it was this meter right here that was indicating upward flow. And again, I couldn't figure out any reason for the, for the strange number. I checked everything, all of the normal sources of error were addressed. Why the, the consistent upward flow? It wasn't just one measurement, I made many measurements. It's a strange thing to have this happen. So again, when we were pulling out, I noticed these holes, and the seepage meter was right here, and there was a hole here. You can see a hole here and a hole here. I just, this was in about two, two and a half meters of water, so I was snorkeling. So I, I snorkeled down, I poked my finger in this hole, and out of this hole popped a crayfish, <laughs> a rusty crayfish. And uh, I thought, huh, I think that's more than just a coincidence that I got strange data from this meter, and a crayfish popped out of this hole when I put my finger in here. There's a connection here. And I think that was my first exposure to bioirrigation. And there was some evidence that these things were, were out here and they were common. There's, there's a carcass of a crayfish that was right on the bed, right next to these holes. Another example of bioirrigation, this is from another a separate lake in northern Minnesota. This one was kind of a surprise. Um, when we measure seepage, we can measure the change in volume by weight using an electronic scale or by volume where you empty the contents of the bag into a graduated cylinder. So uh, I was using the latter approach and I removed the bag and you know you do this, it's not just one meter, it's a bunch of meters so you're doing this and it kind of gets to be a little tedious. So I wasn't really paying a lot of attention, I removed the bag, I closed the valve and I was emptying the water into a graduated cylinder and I heard a plop, a noise. I thought, what? I saw inside of the graduated cylinder a crayfish. Now this is a different species of crayfish. It's a lot smaller. Still, I have no idea how it got through the valve. I have a very small diameter valve. It's as big as valves go, but still, relative to the size of a, a crayfish, how, how could that possibly be? But it got through that hole. And uh, the seepage rates that I measured range from 0 0.01 to 0 0.1 centimeters per day, very slow seepage numbers as they go. But the one with the crayfish was three to six times bigger. <laughs> so that's a substantial bioirrigation, if you will. Another bio, perhaps measurement error, because I'm not sure that this was actually creating seepage on the bed, but it certainly had the opportunity to affect my measurement, was when a leech also swam through that small diameter valve that was open 
and got inside the bag. So when I emptied the bag, I tell you, I had a hard time getting that leech out of the inside of the bag. <laughs> but in this case, I don't think it had an effect on seepage uh, because the, the, uh, the value 6.9 was, was the bag number that I got when the leech was inside. But these organisms live here. They live on and in the bed, and they move around. And evidently, they're pretty adventurous to, uh, to swim through a little narrow, small diameter valve and, and swim into a bag that's, that's attached to some instrument that's clearly foreign to their world. Another example of bio, I'm going to call this bio measurement because I, I don't think these organisms created seepage, but they certainly corrupted my measurement, was from the Russian River in Northern California. This is just north of the San Francisco Bay Area. And I was working here because the water district that supplies water to the Northern Bay Area was having trouble meeting their demand. They were using ranny collectors, large diameter, high volume wells that induce water to flow from the river into the groundwater system and then to the well where they, they pull the water out. They don't have to treat the water as much if they could do it that way. But the sediment bed was clogging because of this downward flow that they were inducing. So we were out measuring the flow and trying to figure out where the bed was clogged. And these are the data that I collected. This is an automated seepage meter now, so I'm getting data every minute. And uh, you can see the data. They're pretty small, averaging about three-tenths of a centimeter per day. You can see lake uh, river stage is changing quite a lot. There's very little, oh, virtually no response in seepage, indicating that, yeah, the bed's clogged here. Seepage rates are slow, no response to changes in gradient. The thing that bothered me were these spikes. The data were very noisy, uncharacteristically noisy. Well, this is an electronic device. It's, it's kind of uh, uh, new. Not many people have been using this, and all kinds of crazy things can happen, and they have. And so I was trying everything I could think of. I thought the cable had a short in it. Maybe the connections were bad. I couldn't figure anything out. And I thought, oh, I don't know. Maybe I should just go home. Well, I, uh, I noticed these, uh, this is the seepage meter here, and you can see these little dots are minnows, little tiny minnows swimming around in the river. And uh, this is the opening to the seepage meter. All the water that, that flows through the seepage meter is, is, has to pass through this opening. Here's one of those little minnows. And I noticed one of the times I just happened to be there taking a photograph, there was a minnow just before when it saw me approach, it swam through the hole. So these minnows were moving through my flow meter, creating little spikes in current that I was actually measuring. And when I averaged those data every minute, I was getting those spikes in the data. So I'm going to call this bio measurement. And this was on an order of 5 to 10 centimeters per day. An example of bioirrigation is uh, from some work I did in New York City. And uh, here we can see this orange line is the seepage rate. And the average number here is about 8 to 12 centimeters per day. Pretty big numbers. And not what we had been seeing at other locations at this site. So I thought if we had time, I'd come back and redeploy, which we did. Uh, luckily, we had time. And this time, we got numbers right in the, in the range that we expected to see. So what was the difference? Why did this deployment work so well and this deployment was, was so messy? And what I had noticed when I broke down after the first deployment, when I was taking things apart, uh, one of these shrimp popped out of my meter. So I think we had shrimp in the, in the sediment bed and maybe even affecting the measurement. So it might have been bio-measurement, might have been bio-irrigation, but I'm, I'm confident that that was the reason for these data here. And my last example is ebullition. These organisms are consuming uh, organic material in the sediment. The methanogens are generating methane, carbon dioxide is being generated. It accumulates in the sediment until it suddenly is released. And commonly, these releases are during low tide, when the surface water pressure is lowest. And this was an ebullition event <laughs> that we created when we idled up to my boat so I could change the battery with another boat that had a motor on it. The vibration of the motor generated this ebullition event. All these bubbles had just just been released. So substantial amounts of gas. So we're making measurements at this location, and you can see the data here are particularly noisy 
And I'm going to zoom in on these data that uh, extend from about 2 in the morning until about 7 in the morning, about one hour after low tide. So the lowest tide was about 6 a.m. These are those data. You can see the data are nice and smooth prior to 2 a.m. Starting at 2 a.m., you get a lot of this noise, these spiky uh, rates of flow that we recorded with the flow meter. And I'm confident that this is right when the, the uh, ebullition was occurring. In fact, the numbers got so big that uh, it, the, the instrument went out of range. Uh, the numbers were too large to measure. And then when the tide started to rise again, the data got clean again. We uh, collected gas during this measurement. I collected over two liters of gas. So quite a bit of ebullition was occurring. It was probably creating quite a bit of seepage that we would have never thought about if we were just using uh, gradients to determine this. And climate change may be a factor. The same people that showed the data with the coronamids also did a study relating the coronamid density to temperature, and they show a clear relation with temperature, and they said that with a warming temperature, it could relate to, uh, lead to greater bioirrigation, which could then lead to greater respiration and oxygenation of the sediments in these shallow lakes. But another study, this one was from northern Minnesota, said that if we have warmer climate, we have longer periods of stratification in these lakes, which means longer periods of the lower, deeper waters being separated from the oxygenated surface waters, so that we've got longer periods of anoxic conditions, which then would cause these organisms to decrease in number. So we don't know which way it's going to go globally, but climate change could have an effect on this. So to close, the lesson learned here is that biology matters. <laughs> there are a lot of processes out there that are not related to the hydraulic gradients that we typically measure. And we need to be aware of these processes if we're trying to quantify these exchanges. And the other lesson that I've learned over and over again is that you can't do this alone. These kinds of uh, activities are labor intensive. They require a lot of work. And I've been very fortunate to have had some great students over the years um, that, have, that have helped a lot with this endeavor. Most recently, Jose Nieto Lopez, who is right here. <laughs> and, and Jose came to the US and worked with me for a few months, and he was a, a huge help. And he and his colleagues all this week have been in the background and sometimes in the foreground, making this conference run unbelievably smoothly. And so I hope you'd be willing to join me in giving them a round of applause, Jose and all his colleagues, for, for helping us all out here and uh, making this conference such a success. So, <laughs> and that's it. I don't know how much time we have. Okay, thank you very much. Uh,